Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'll start today, as I always do, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. Um, as at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,185 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 29 from yesterday. A total of 1,200 patients are in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a total decrease of 69 from yesterday, including a decrease of 16 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 36 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is a decrease of four since yesterday. And I'm able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,589 patients who had tested positive and required hospitalisation have been able now to leave hospital. Unfortunately, though, in the past 24 hours, 18 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,291. Uh, yesterday was, of course, a bank holiday, and registration may have been lower, uh, so that should be taken into account when considering today's figures. Uh, each one of these, of course, is uh, not just a, a figure. Each one is an individual whose loss is being grieved by many. And as I always do, I want to send my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. Uh, let me also express my gratitude, um, again, as I always do, to our health and care workers who continue to do uh, an incredible, exceptional job in the most difficult of circumstances. Now, today I want to take a little bit of time uh, to focus on the launch uh, later this week of NHS Scotland's Test, Trace and Isolate programme, which is called uh, Test and Protect in Scotland, and the logo for it you will see on the screen behind me. From the end of uh, this week, through Test and Protect, anyone who suspects uh, that they have COVID-19, uh, anyone who has the, the symptoms that we advise you uh, to be aware of, will be tested. Uh, if you test positive, your close contacts will be traced and advised to isolate for 14 days. Now, the aim of Test and Protect is to quickly identify cases of the virus and then act to break the chains of transmission. You may recall that on the 4th of May, we published our initial plans uh, for this programme. And I can confirm today that the system will go live in every single one of Scotland's, Scotland's 14 health board areas on Thursday of this week. Now, Test and Protect will be an extremely important tool for us in the months ahead. It will help us suppress the virus while we slowly ease lockdown restrictions. But I need to stress today that it will only be effective if we all play our part. So today I want to briefly set out what the capacity of the new system will be at the point of launch and how this will develop. And I'll also set out how you as an individual, your household, your workplace and your employer can support us in making it work. Uh, firstly, we said that to launch Test and Protect nationally, we needed the ability to conduct more than 15,000 tests a day. I can confirm that this capacity is now in place. That capacity is being delivered through a combination of NHS labs, academic partners, the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service and the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow. Secondly, we said we would enhance and extend use of the software that public health teams already use for contact tracing in relation to other infectious diseases. Uh, that software has been piloted in Fife, Lanarkshire and Highland over the past week, and I can confirm that it will be operational in every health board by Thursday. Uh, thirdly, we said that we'd aim to have 2,000 contact tracers available by the end of this month. Now, I should say that based on our current demand estimates, we assess that around 700 will actually be needed in the early phase. However, I can confirm that by the end of the month, we will have a pool of around 2,000 to draw on if necessary. Now, this is a system that will operate at a scale not seen before in Scotland. We have, of course, had testing and contact tracing uh, before, but we are it's substantially increasing the scale. Uh, therefore, over the first couple of weeks, it will need to bed down, uh, but introducing it at the same time as we take the first very cautious steps out of lockdown gives us the opportunity to address any operational issues ahead of a potentially more substantial easing of restrictions at the next review date in three weeks. 
Over the next few weeks, we will, however, also add enhancements to the system. As I said earlier, the technology used by contact tracers will be in place from the start, but we will also add a digital platform to allow people who test positive to enter details of their contacts online. We'll also continue to build testing capacity because we need, may need more uh, than the 15,500 in future. And we will work over the next few weeks to make access to testing more locally accessible. And we'll keep you updated on all of that. Let me now outline what we are asking you, the public, to do. Uh, let me stress that just like lockdown itself, really, this is something that will only have the desired effect if we all do what is required. It cannot be seen as optional. To make sure we all understand what is required of us, uh, I can tell you that a public awareness campaign will start later on this week. And during June, information will be delivered directly to every household across the country. But I want today to set out some of the basics. Uh, firstly, as of Thursday, we are asking that if you have any of the symptoms of COVID-19, remember that is a cough, temperature or loss of taste or smell, uh, that you take immediate steps to book a test. Uh, please don't wait to see if you feel better after a, a day or two. Time really is of the essence here, so get in touch as soon as you experience symptoms. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you can go to nhsinform.scot or if you can't get online, you can call NHS 24 on 0800 028 2816. Online, you can ask for a test for yourself or someone else that you live with and book it at one of the drive through testing centres or mobile testing units. For some, there will also be the option of a home testing kit. And as I said earlier, we will be working in the coming weeks to further expand local access to testing. If you can't go online, you should call NHS 24. I'll uh, repeat the number 0800 028 2816. You will speak to an advisor who will then go through some questions with you and book you in for a test. Now, while you wait for your test and the result, it's essential that you and your household self-isolate, which of course is what we advise you to do already if you have symptoms. That means staying at home at all times with the exception of going out for the test. You shouldn't though go to the shops, out for exercise or see anybody else. In line with current guidance, the person with symptoms should isolate for seven days from the start of those symptoms. Other members of the household should self-isolate for 14 days. And if any of them start to delay, uh, display symptoms during that time, they will also go through the testing process. If your test comes back negative, you and your household can end your isolation at that point. However, if you're contacted to be told that you have tested positive, you will be asked at that stage for details of people that you have been in contact with. Now, the definition of a contact is people within your household, people you've had face-to-face -face contact with and people that you've been within two metres uh, of for a period of 15 minutes or more. Uh, and the contact tracers who take the details will, of course, guide you through that. Now, I want to uh, take the opportunity now to assure you that your privacy will be respected at all times during this process. The information you provide will be held securely within the NHS and it will be used only for the purposes of tracing your contacts. Uh, let me be very clear, it will not be used by the Scottish Government. Indeed, we won't have access to the information. All of the work of identifying and tracing contacts will be done within Scotland's NHS. Let me turn briefly now to what you do if you receive a call from a contact tracer to say that you've been in contact with someone who has tested positive. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that how you, how any of us, uh, respond at that point will be vital in breaking the chains of transmission of the virus and, and stopping spread. So if you get that call, uh, you will be asked to self-isolate immediately. The success of Test and Protect will really depend on all of us trusting this advice and for the sake of ourselves and for each other, agreeing to abide by it. If you're at work, the advice will be to immediately head home, taking care to come into contact with as few people as possible. And we are publishing guidance uh, today, I think we have published it this morning, for employers making clear that they should support any member of staff who is asked to self-isolate through Test and Protect. 
Now, if you're well, if you don't have symptoms yourself uh, and you are able to work from home, then your employer may very well expect you to do that, but they should not ask you to go into work. The Scottish Government is also in contact with the UK Government to ensure that employment rights and entitlement to benefits, including statutory sick pay, take account of the fact that people might be off work or unable to attend appointments through no fault of their own. Uh, we've also published today general advice for anyone who is asked to self-isolate. Remember, this is something that over the months ahead could happen to any of us on more than one occasion. Uh, this guidance includes hygiene advice for your home, advice for other people in your household, what to do if you care for someone who is shielding or clinically vulnerable, and what to do if you need help accessing food and medicine or even uh, accommodation. It also suggests how all of us can make some preparations in advance. Now, I know I've uh, just run through a lot of information there for you to take in, but don't worry. Uh, remember, I said at the outset there will be a public awareness campaign starting later this week, and we will take steps to ensure that everyone knows what we're asking you to do. Uh, this is a big thing. It really matters. Um, and therefore, we will be very careful in making sure that the different steps are well understood. But for now, let me leave you with these points. Test and Protect is a really important tool for us in the period ahead. The more effective it is, the more of the lockdown restrictions we will be able to lift. However, and this is an important point, uh, although it is uh, vital, it can't do all of the work of suppressing the virus on its own. All of us will continue to have a really vital role to play in our everyday lives. And that means even as we ease lockdown, Physical distancing, good hygiene and following appropriate advice, whatever advice is in place at the time, will continue to be essential. And so too will all of us doing what is asked of us. Test and protect will only work. It will only be effective if we all come forward for testing when we have symptoms and if we all agree to self-isolate when we are asked to do so. Uh, and of course, it will only work if the government steps up to give you the support you need to do so. In short, Test and Protect is going to require exactly the same spirit of solidarity and care for each other as lockdown has done. It will be a collective national endeavour. People will need the help of family, friends, colleagues and employers, volunteers who have been supporting efforts to distribute food and care for the vulnerable through lockdown will have a part to play in supporting people through Test and Protect. And government will have to ensure the right capacity resources and support is in place and all of us will have to agree to make sacrifices for the common good just as we have been doing in these past weeks. In short, and, and this I, I guess is the, the nub of what Test and Protect is intended to do, by agreeing that some of us will have to stay at home at times when we have symptoms, test positive or have been in contact with someone who tests positive, we will be gradually able to move away from a situation that we have now where everyone is being asked to stay at home all of the time. Now, as I said earlier, we will make much more information available in the days and weeks to come, but I wanted today uh, to give you a preview of what is a significant initiative. But let me leave you with the most important message. From Thursday, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, you should go online to NHS Inform or call NHS 24 0800 028 2816 and book a test straight away. Uh, but for now, all of us must continue to stick with the lockdown measures. So please uh, stay at home for now, except for essential purposes. When you do leave the house, stay more than two metres away from others and don't meet up with people from households other than your own. You should wear a face covering if you're in an enclosed space, such as a shop or on public transport. And that is one of the issues that will be covered in the transport transition plan that the Transport Secretary will outline in the Scottish Parliament later this afternoon. Um, you should also continue to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And if you or someone else in your household has symptoms of COVID-19, uh, then right now, even before the launch of Test and Protect, then you should stay at home completely. At the moment, these actions are vital to slow the spread of the virus even more, to continue to protect the NHS and to save life. So my thanks once again to all of you for your patience, your forbearance um, and your willingness to make these sacrifices for the good of all of us. Now, I've taken uh, a little bit of time uh, today to go through that, such as the importance of test and protect. Uh, 
therefore I'm going to now go straight to questions from journalists, but you will have seen I'm joined here uh, today by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief uh, Nursing Officer, who will of course uh, be helping me answer the questions that are put to us. Uh, but first up today, I'm going to uh, go to Glenn Campbell from the BBC. First Minister, the BBC poll today suggests that 70% of people think we locked down too late there's probably much in that poll that you agree with, but I wonder, do you agree with the majority who think we locked down too late? Um, I think it is a perfectly legitimate and understandable question to ask. And I think in the fullness of time, we will want to look back and, and really take a very hard look at what we did right and what we might have done differently had we known now, uh, then, uh, uh, had we known then what we know now uh, about the virus. So I... You know, I, I don't shy away from that. Uh, what I do say is that we took the decisions we thought were best at the time based on the knowledge and information we had at the time. But you know, we will have made mistakes. Uh, every government in the world will have made mistakes. And I think it's really important for the future uh, that we are candid uh, about that uh, when the time comes to look at that properly. All I would say, uh, I suppose, in addition to that, is over uh, the weeks I've stood here taking questions, I've been asked uh, questions about our past approach uh, that come from both ends of the spectrum. So I've been asked legitimately the question, did we uh, lock down too late? And equally, I've been asked, and those who've watched uh, throughout will have heard me being asked these questions, uh, is there any point of lockdown at all? And we've had, you know, Swedish uh, expert opinion uh, put to us saying, you know, lockdown is pointless because those who are going to get the virus will get it anyway. So we take the best decisions we can at the time. We we try to learn as we go. And of course, in the fullness of time, there will be real scrutiny and inquiry into what went right uh, and what we could have done better. And I uh, am absolutely uh, in agreement that that's important and indeed will welcome that because this uh, is hopefully uh, we will not have another pandemic for a long, long time to come, but we may well have pandemics in the future, and it's important that we learn lessons uh, as, as we come out of this one. Uh, Colin, uh, um, sorry. Is it possible to say why, while it's important to have the R number below one on the way out of lockdown, why it was allowed to get between four and six on, on the way in? Um, maybe hand over to, to Gregor there. I think you say allowed to. We, we, we got to a situation where we had a fairly widespread community transmission of the virus. Um, and, you know, that was, um, if, if we go back to uh, press updates at that time, you would have heard me and the then Chief Medical Officer talking about that at the time. And that uh, guided our move from, if you remember, the four-stage, uh, not the current four-stage plan to come out of lockdown, but that four-stage plan that all four nations of the UK uh, published at the outset that uh, took us from contain uh, into delay uh, of the virus, and that was about community transmission. So, you know, these are our judgments we made, uh, and, and all of the steps we have taken all along have been about trying to slow down, firstly contain, and then to slow down the spread of uh, the virus, and that will continue to be the case. I've talked here now for uh, more than two months about the importance of slowing the spread of the virus, uh, which is uh, what uh, drove us at an earlier stage and what has driven us right through lockdown. Do you want to say more? It's perhaps not surprising that the R number was, was much higher um, back in those early stages because there was much more of the population that was susceptible to the virus at that point in time as well. And when you look at the way that the virus was introduced to the United Kingdom with um, multiple introductions of the virus across the country into communities, some of which were able to be detected, some of which were, were not detected, um, just because the, uh, the, the, there wasn't the, the knowledge about the, the type of symptoms at that point in time that people might experience. It's, as I say, it's no surprise to me or to epidemiologists that, that at that point in time, our number was very much greater in the United Kingdom. The important thing is that the measures that were taken allowed that our number and the number of infections which were developing to be greatly reduced so that we could get a sense of control over the way that this virus was spreading. The other thing I'd say about your, your findings today, firstly, as I said in Parliament last week, handling of this virus is not some kind of popularity contest. It's about trying to do the right things uh, based on the information we've got. But of course, it shows uh, right now uh, strong support for uh, the government's uh, phased and careful and cautious approach 
coming out of lockdown. And I don't take that for granted. It's why I think it's so important that at every stage of uh, the process now, I stand here and explain to you why I'm asking you to continue to do things, uh, the reasons for that and, and the actions we're taking to come out of that. So I, I never take that support for granted because uh, we are asking everybody to do really difficult things and it's important that we continue to, to have that very open conversation about it. Uh, Colin White from STV. Minister, is there any uh, improvement in the speed at which test results come back? And secondly, what's your reaction to the resignation today of Douglas Ross? Um, on uh, the turnaround time for testing, uh, I think we are, uh, possibly Gregor or, or Fiona might want to say something here, we are seeing uh, reductions in the turnaround times for tests, but we are trying to get that uh, even uh, lower uh, than it is and shorter rather than it is right now, because as I said in my opening remarks, speed is of the essence. So from the point somebody phones up or goes online with symptoms, that's why I said don't wait. Um, you know, we, we all know what we can be like um, when we, we feel a bit unwell. You might sort of decide to wait a few hours or a day to see if you feel better. It's really important you don't do that right now, that you book a test uh, straight away, get tested as quickly as possible, and then the processing of that test is done really quickly so that the contact tracing process can also be done quickly. So we are uh, trying to reduce that as, as much as possible. I don't know whether Fiona or Gregor want to take that before I come back to the second yeah, part of your I question. Mean, if we look at the, the, the kind of turnaround times for tests from the beginning when we started testing compared to now, we've certainly um, been able to make a, a, a huge impact in the, the duration of reporting. Um, for, for, for a test result to be kind of given back to a patient. And we're still exploring ways that we can improve that further. And I expect that over the coming weeks and months, we'll refine uh, new techniques in, in terms of how we can do that, looking at how we can pull samples and, and, and manage to kind of um, take those samples through the, the, the kind of processes in a, in a really safe and efficient way so that we can further reduce the amount of time it takes for a, 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 the, the, the kind of whole testing process from beginning to end. We should remember that the lab part of the process is only uh, one aspect of it. It's also how you sample it, how you get it to the lab, and then how you return that result back to a patient as well. That should all be factored in to this whole duration of the reporting of tests. And on the second part of your question, fair play to Douglas Ross. I think like the uh, what I would suspect is the majority of the population uh, he believes that uh, Dominic Cummings' actions were were not acceptable uh, and that the handling of that and the retrospective rewriting of the rules to try and uh, somehow justify it is, is not acceptable either. And I, I, I think he's taken the principled uh, position of uh, resigning uh, from the UK government and uh, we'll see whether uh, others uh, decide to follow suit. I, I've, I've had my say on Dominic Cummings. I, I don't intend to say very much more about it. My, my views are well known. Uh, my focus right now, as it has been for the past couple of months, is on continuing to, to tackle this crisis. And, you know, things like uh, Test and Protect that I've been talking about today are massive, massive pieces of work for any government. And uh, my job is to stay uh, focused on all of that. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. Um, Scotland's universities and places of higher education speak of their economic troubles, economic Armageddon. They say they're in a very serious state and they stress the importance of tuition fees. Will you guarantee that you will not scrap tuition fees? Uh, well, I, I will guarantee that I will uh, not uh, introduce uh, tuition fees. It's free tuition we have uh, in Scotland and, and I don't want to see uh, students having to pay tuition. Um, and I don't think transferring the, the genuine and very real financial challenges that universities uh, face onto the shoulders of, of students or graduates is, is the way to do it. University graduates who often earn more uh, pay more through income tax and that is how we should fund our education system. So that's not a change in my view, it's a, a view I've uh, expressed many times before and, and believe very strongly. That said, universities do face uh, an extremely difficult uh, financial challenge. Uh, the Scottish Government has already announced additional research funding to help in the short term with that challenge. Uh, through the Funding Council, we're in discussions with universities and the sector overall and we'll continue to, to work with them to help as far as we can them uh, navigate through what is a, a difficult situation now and undoubtedly in the period to come. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. You've just uh, spelled out the further steps you're going to take on test, trace and isolate or test and protect, uh, as you call it. You have there said that it needs time to bed down. 
You've also said that you want to uh, further expand the capacity. If the transport sector is today unveiling the transition plan for transport, if you haven't got to where you want to be on your test and trace uh, policy, what confidence can people have to go back on public transport if you're not there yet? Okay, I think you misunderstood me, uh, Peter, which I'll take responsibility for. Uh, we, we are where we want to be for what we think the capacity will be over this uh, next phase uh, of, of easing uh, lockdown. Uh, what I talked about was inevitably with a system that is being scaled up, you will have teething problems and no doubt operational challenges which will bed down over the next couple of weeks. But we believe we have the capacity uh, that will be required both in terms of uh, test capacity and uh, contact tracing uh, capacity that will allow us to get this system underway properly. What I'm saying is we may need greater capacity in the future. That is impossible to predict because we cannot uh, predict with certainty the, the path that the virus will take. So we uh, are absolutely planning to go beyond 15,500 tests. We are planning to uh, potentially go beyond 2,000 contact tracers. Uh, but I, I don't want anybody to think that we don't have the capacity that we need to turn the system on on Thursday. Fiona, do you want to add? I, I think that's right. Because of course the, the advice is going to continue. Socially distance, um, work at home when you can, wash your hands. So all of that will still be there. And therefore, that the whatever the First Minister announces at the end of the week, that gradual lifting is not going to push people into close contact with each other, and it will be gradual. The other aspect is, as less and less people have the virus, we have the, the testing capacity that, that that is leaving open means that that testing capacity will be available as we see reductions uh, in overall infections, whether it's within our care homes or people being admitted to hospitals. So it's all the part of that overall plan means that any gradual increase in capacity that may be needed for the test and protect will be there absolutely from day one and will work on in the future. Yeah, I mean, this, remember, and, and I don't want to sound uh, a, a single note of complacency here because I'm, I'm not, but the numbers I'm reporting to you every day around uh, numbers of new confirmed cases, hospitalisations, they all say that certainly in the community, uh, the transmission of the virus is reducing um, and, and we need to keep it suppressed through the the changes to behaviour that we've all been undertaking. Now, we can't stay in lockdown forever, but all of these uh, physical distancing measures, hygiene, that is about all of us trying to keep numbers of new cases as low as possible. Um, now, if the virus starts to spread a bit more quickly, if it does that in particular areas, test and protect is a capacity that we then bring in to try to stamp it out. But for it to be as effective as possible and not to be overwhelmed, then it's really important that we all continue to work together to keep uh, the virus as suppressed as, as possible. And, you know, we've had a lot of discussions in, in recent times about you've got X testing capacity, but you're only doing Y tests. Now, there will still be discussion about that because we will also be uh, continuing to do routine testing in care homes, for example. Uh, but in actual fact, we will want to see in the weeks to come demand for testing from people with symptoms reducing because that will be a sign that we're continuing uh, to uh, suppress the virus. So we actually want to see, uh, certainly in that symptomatic uh, part of the demand for testing, these numbers decline. It's when these numbers are going up that we will have evidence that the virus is spreading again. So we obviously don't want to see that if we can uh, possibly avoid it. Uh, Jack Foster from Global. Good afternoon, First Minister. We've all sadly heard stories about fraudsters looking to take advantage of this crisis. We also know that the victims of these sorts of scammers tend to be vulnerable or elderly people via scam phone calls. How risky, therefore, is it to launch this contact tracing system which relies so heavily on what are, in effect, unsolicited phone calls to contacts who have potentially been infected? How much thought has been given to that and how can people be certain that the person on the other end of the phone is genuine and simply looking and, and not simply looking to gather information about them? Uh, that's a, a good question and we uh, are taking steps at every uh, stage here uh, to protect 
uh, people's privacy and to make sure there is security. We will make sure that we give more details about exactly what those steps are, both in terms of the people giving the information about contact tracers and the people who are being contacted uh, by a, a contact tracer in, in terms of the steps that will be taken to ensure verification of identity and, and such like. One of the things which is I accept about privacy rather than security is when you are called to say you've been in contact, and this is probably quite a hard thing for people to maybe initially get their head around, when you're called to say you've been in contact with somebody who's got the virus, you won't be told who it is that has tested positive because they have the right to confidentiality. Uh, now, there will be an understandable desire on all of our parts to say, who was it that I've been in contact with? But, but we can't do that. So there is going to have to be a lot of trust in this system. And therefore, your question is important about how we build and maintain that trust. So we'll ensure that we, in addition to all of the other guidance we put out, we, we will put some information out there about the, the security and the steps that will be taken to uh, protect the security of that system. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, ahead of the public transport plan being set out this afternoon, you said people should wear face coverings if they're using public transport. Why not make it mandatory so there's one clear rule for us all to follow? and we uh, will keep that under review. The short answer right now, which I've, I've covered before um, a little bit, is that we know that there are some people for whom wearing face masks would be difficult, people with particular health conditions, um, you know, with asthma, for example. So we, we have, uh, plus the fact we acknowledge that the evidence on this is, I think, important and strong enough to uh, recommend that we do it, but you know, that there have been differences of opinion about it, but we are keeping this under review, but there will be very clearly expressed, and I won't go into too much detail because Michael Matheson is giving a statement to Parliament, so it has to be obviously given to Parliament first, but there will be a very clear expectation that people on public transport uh, wear face coverings where uh, they can, uh, because that is about protecting other people that in that kind of uh, in close space, you may find it more difficult, even though there will be strenuous efforts to keep two metres social distancing. There are some circumstances in where that is uh, more difficult. So Michael will set that out uh, in more detail this afternoon. But on the point of uh, you know, a, a strong piece of advice versus uh, mandatory, that is something we will absolutely keep under review as we go forward. Um, Neil Puran from PA. Thanks, First Minister. <clears throat> On the test and protect plan, which you've just set out, um, uh, as you've said, uh, absolutely anybody could have to self-isolate for 14 days if one of their contacts tests positive. And of course, that could lead to some serious financial hardship for people. Uh, do you expect employers to keep people uh, on full wages during that 14 day period or put them on statutory sick pay? And also, what support is there for people who are self-employed who might see all of their income dry up? We are, uh, so the guidance we've published today for employers uh, says to employers that we would expect them to work to protect the income of people who are self-isolating, but there is also a role here for uh, statutory benefits, including statutory sick pay. We are not entirely in control of that. Um, and this applies to self-employed people and, and the benefit system as well. These are issues we are in discussion uh, with the UK government about because it is really important uh, that people have the support they need to self-isolate for periods. As I've candidly said before, may be multiple. We hope that's not the case. We hope the virus will continue to uh, decline in the community and this will not happen to lots of people and certainly not happen on multiple occasions, but it is, it is possible that it will. Uh, we're also uh, putting in place support, which will build on the support that's been in place for the shielded category. If people don't have uh, family networks and can, that can get them food and medicine, uh, or even if people's own accommodation is such that self-isolating away from other household members would be difficult. There will, in extremists, be help with accommodation as well. So all of these plans are, are being put in place and will continue to develop as we uh, go through this. Um, I don't know whether either of you want to add to that. I think that's why from Gregor talked earlier about uh, making sure that the turnaround time is, is as quick as possible. Because remember, if someone has symptoms, they will be tested. Uh, they might test negative, in which case their, their close contacts at the moment would not necessarily be, be, be traced. But if they're positive, again, the assessment would be done as to whether they would need to be considered to be at risk themselves. So uh, if we manage to maintain social distance, keep our hands washed, then the actual number of people 
who will have been in that close proximity and, and therefore who will be affected uh, will, will be kept to as low a level as possible. And that, of course, helps us then. It, it's a benefit to everyone in terms of not having to, to self-isolate or be tested. And it means that the virus is further suppressed. One of the really important um, and, you know, to be candid, quite difficult things I've got to try and uh, communicate to all of you very clearly over uh, this next period is that while test and protect is really important, we can't allow it to uh, give us the, or we can't allow the impression uh, to be seeded in our minds that because we've got test and protect, the rest of us don't have uh, to continue to do things to suppress the virus. We, we can't uh, allow ourselves to believe that it will bear all the burden. Because if we stop uh, physical distancing, if we stop washing our hands, if we stop doing all of the other things that people are being advised to do, which will start to change a little bit, then the virus will spring out of control again and test and protect will then struggle uh, to cope. We will be able to scale up it, its capacity, but a bit like we've been saying, do all these things right now so the NHS doesn't get overwhelmed. There will be a need to continue to do some of these things to make sure test and protect doesn't get overwhelmed. So it's going to be a really important tool but it's part of a, a box of tools uh, and just as important are all the things we're asking uh, every, every one of us to do around physical distancing, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's really important that we all, just as we've all come to understand why the lockdown measures matter so much, it's really important as we go into this next phase, we understand test and protect in its own terms, but also in the wider context of that overall fight against the virus. Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Thank you, uh, First Minister. Um, you referred earlier to um, the slow easing of the lockdown in Scotland, depending on prevalence of cases in the community. But looking at the numbers um, we have today, and we've all been looking at these numbers over the past two months, um, we've seen further significant falls, particularly when I look at intensive care. I think it was 36 cases you mentioned, which is, I think, the lowest that's ever been hospital cases being significantly suppressed. I'm wondering if there's some kind of marker point that the health officials have identified which may prompt you to um, accelerate the four-phase strategy for exit from lockdown. And also, if I may, on um, test and protect, where we talked about people who maybe get the phone call to say they've been in touch with an infected person, go home and isolate for 14 days. Um, is there any provision for those individuals to get priority or quick fire testing which may allow them to get back to work if they're negative so in that last part of the question if they develop symptoms they will then get tested and then if they were positive their contacts would be be traced again this comes back to uh, you know we we have to uh, be a little bit careful when it comes to testing uh, asymptomatic people because it may give us some false uh, assurance uh, i think Gregor, do you want to complete that point before I come on to the yeah, I mean, I think latter there's part? There's a really important principle in here. If, if you've been in contact with someone who has been positive, if you've been told that you have been traced as part of this contact tracing uh, process and you then go on to develop symptoms, it's really important that on the development of those symptoms you are then tested. However, if even if you test negative at that point in time, you should go on to complete your 14-day isolation period and I want to emphasise that point because it, just because you test negative at that point in time doesn't mean to say that you won't go on to become positive or develop further symptoms during the rest of that 14-day process uh, period. So, as I say, I think we just need to be really clear about the requirements that have been placed on, on, on people uh, around about this. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, and on the first part of your question, the, the route map that we set out last week, and in fact the, the previous two papers, talked about the basket of measures that we will use to make these decisions. The R number, um, as we've talked about before, really important. Uh, so too is the, the relationship between the R number and incidence of cases, so the number of new cases each day. But that supplementary basket of measures, which are the ones you've talked about, uh, uh, hospital admissions, ICU admissions and, you know, sadly, the, the number of deaths. Uh, so there's no, there's no sort of uh, set line uh, that we draw, but these things are, are all taken into account and then the advice will give us uh, the steer as to how quickly we can move in, in easing the lockdown. And as I said last week, we set out a cautious uh, pathway ahead. If the evidence tells us we can um, accelerate that at any stage, then we will we will do that. I've always said, and it's it's worth repeating, that we don't want to keep these measures in place longer than we have to. 
But the other side of that coin is just as important. If we release them too early, even if we think things are, are looking OK, if we release them too early or too quickly, the danger is it takes off again very quickly. So this is a difficult balancing act uh, and there's a lot of judgment and there will always be a degree of risk involved, but we have to manage that based on the best evidence uh, that we have at our disposal. Michael Blackley from the Mail. Hi, good afternoon. Um, one of the concerns with the testing scheme already has been the, the difficulties for some people who can't, who don't drive and, and can't get to the testing centres. Um, you made reference to home testing. Can you give a bit more detail on just who will be able to get a home testing kit? How many of them will, will there be? And what is the solution for people that can get to, to testing centres? I'll hand over to Fiona in a second, but can I firstly just draw a distinction, um, which may seem a bit of a, an obscure distinction, between home testing kits and being tested at home. They're not necessarily the same thing. So a home testing kit is where you get a kit through uh, the post, or I think through the post, and you have to test yourself and, and send it back. Um, the... Uh, online uh, approach that I've spoken about will, will tell people whether they are able to, to get a home testing kit. Um, you know, some people are, will not be that comfortable with doing it because it involves doing the test yourself. What we are looking to do over time is expand the ways in which we might be able to test people at home, but it will be a test done by a health professional or somebody trained to do that rather than a test you're having to do yourself. So that's what we're quite keen to, to develop. That won't be uh, immediately, but that's what we will seek to enhance uh, over the period. It, what is there immediately are the mobile testing uh, units, which go to different parts. I think there's 13 of them um, at the moment, and they move around every few days, which will be a, an important part of this. And I think what we are wanting people to do is, where it is possible for them to go to a unit and get tested themselves, we would encourage them to do that. There's then going to be people who, who, who physically, um, they may have symptoms but they feel well enough, but actually they have to go in public transport. Well, we're not wanting that to happen either. And then there's going to be a number of people who actually cannot leave their home. And we're very keen that we provide that at-home service to, to that group of people and wider so that the overall strategy is everybody who needs a test gets one. So we will be encouraging people to, to go to the, the, the units. As the First Minister said, we also have drive-through. And today we're having a... a conversation about how do we disperse more testing capacity uh, across the, the country so that it is as near as possible and as convenient as possible, because we know it's not always convenient for, for people to, to travel, um, particularly in rural areas. And that's then when we have to have that mix of locally provided or it may be easier to provide at home. But what we are working towards as soon as we can is having the at-home testing for people who absolutely cannot leave their home. I mean, we will work really hard to make this as accessible for people as possible, particularly those who, for a variety of reasons, don't find it easy to leave their home or to travel any distance. But again, you know, one of the hard things I have to level with you on is that all of this, every single aspect of dealing with this horrible virus right now, involves a bit of sacrifice and inconvenience on all of our parts. And, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell you that that is going to end uh, in the immediate future. So e this test and protect system, uh, for it to work, whether it is about going to get a test or then isolating when you're told to, it's asking all of us to, to live our lives slightly differently. And, and I'm, you know, I, it wouldn't be fair of me to stand here and say that all of that inconvenience will be able to be taken away. All I can say to you is we will try to reduce it as much as possible and make this as easy and as accessible a process as we possibly can. Tom Martin from the Express. Hi, uh, hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, just on the pool of two thousand, um, the health secretary a couple of weeks ago referred to um, possible involvement of St Andrews ambulance volunteers. I just wondered: is are they still going to be involved? Is there any idea of how many of them will be required to help with this pool of two thousand? Um, there is still a potential pool, although it's not necessarily one we will uh, deploy immediately. So uh, as of today, we have uh, 1,615 uh, contact tracers um, identified. Um, 1,515 of them come from uh, NHS boards, uh, including the ambulance service. Um, there's uh, 
the other hundred from National uh, NSS and Public Health Scotland. There are also uh, a number of NHS returners uh, being assessed um, at the moment. Um, and all of that is before we start to recruit from the 27,000 applications that we've had. And they're being uh, processed, I think, at the rate of uh, 150 uh, a day right now. The closing date for that advert, of course, was uh, just Friday of last week. And over time, uh, we will recruit from that to um, replace current NHS staff who maybe been redeployed to do this work because they're not doing what they would normally be doing. There are some who will be, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, because the, the NHS is operating differently right now, able to do this, that they might not be able to do it in a few months, so we will recruit to replace that. So uh, that's 1,615 that we know we have right now, and we expect that to be around the 2,000 uh, by the end of the month. So that is absolutely on track. But let me uh, repeat what I said earlier on. Based on our assessments of the, the prevalence of the virus and therefore the demand for this, uh, our current estimate is that in the early phase of this, we will probably only need about 700 contact tracers. So I hope that gives people um, some assurance that we have the capacity we need, but also the ability to upscale that capacity should demand be greater than we anticipate it to be. Do you want to add anything? Um, Vivi, sorry, no. Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um. Boris Johnson announced yesterday that shops are going to start reopening in England next month. And also, I think he said car showrooms because their large footprint makes it easy to uh, do social distancing. Uh, under the plan you unveiled last week, small shops and outdoor markets are in phase two and large shops phase three. I just wanted to clarify whether car showrooms are outdoor markets or large retail units. And could you explain the logic of opening large shops later because instinctually you think it would be easier to have social distancing in a shop with a large floor footprint than in a small shop? Um, the logic uh, really is about numbers of people that you would have congregating uh, potentially but the point about social distancing is, is certainly a valid point to make so we will also be looking at some of the finer detail of that you know even for larger shops could they open a portion of it, for example. So all of these things, we want to get shops open as quickly as possible, but it has to be safe. And, you know, Fiona Hislop over uh, the, the coming days will be setting out sectoral guidance that will help uh, companies prepare for, for what they need to do. In terms of the phasing, um, I will set out on Thursday. Well, firstly, are we going into phase one of uh, easing of lockdown? And if we are, which I at this stage anticipate we will be, uh, but what measures we will start to ease, uh, as you say, retail other than outdoor retail uh, would be in phase two. Now, I can't tell you right now exactly when phase two will begin, but we have a, a three weekly review cycle. So it is, it is possible, uh, and I put it no more strongly than that, that at least aspects of phase two could kick in in Scotland uh, round about the middle of June or, or slightly after that. So we will continue to assess all of these things very carefully and very cautiously. Um, my... Uh, only guiding principle right now is getting the virus suppressed and keeping it suppressed and consistent with that, getting the, the economy going and our everyday lives going uh, as close to normal as possible, as quickly as possible. But as I've set out many times before, these are not absolutely, absolutely clear equations. There's a lot of difficult judgments and balancing acts that we've got to, to have here and we'll make, it, make these as carefully as possible. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, we see today the level of backlog we've had in diagnostics, outpatients and treatment time guaranteed procedures. By the end of March, more than 19,000 had waited more than six weeks for diagnostics, even though there were almost 9,000 fewer referrals, there were almost 10,000 fewer admissions compared to the same time last year. And of those who were admitted, just 68.7% percent met the treatment time guarantee with almost 80,000 waiting to be treated at the end of March. There's also a 29 percent reduction in outpatients being seen in time with almost 65,000 waiting for appointments. With the mothballing of these services over the past three months, these figures will have undoubtedly worsened. So what steps are being taken um, with easing to clear this huge backlog? So the, the pausing of some elective procedures, many elective procedures in the NHS, I just want to remind people, is not something we did lightly. It was necessary in order to uh, ensure that uh, the NHS could have capacity to deal with coronavirus and also that 
hospitals were, were safe for, for people. We are now, of course, uh, looking ahead to restarting as much of that as possible. The Health Secretary will say more about that next week, but I can uh, tell you today that the, the Scottish uh, Government Cabinet, which met this morning, meets every Tuesday morning, uh, looked at uh, this in detail, um, and uh, that phasing of a restart, as I say, will be something the, the Health Secretary will set out in more detail um, next week. Uh, I should say the Health Secretary is currently uh, about to be in Parliament uh, answering questions, which is uh, why she's not able to be with us today. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. I just wondered if you could clarify what um, will constitute close contacts between people when they're being asked to trace um, or uh, tell people who they've been in contact with under the uh, test, trace and isolate policy. In the early stages of the government guidance, it said either a face-to-face -face contact or spending more than 15 minutes within two metres of an infected person. Only the latter has been uh, referenced by yourself and the health secretary, particularly around the Nike conference. So I just wondered, will face-to-face -face contact be included and what's the definition of that? Okay. Um I did cover this in my opening remarks, Kieran, but you may not have, have been able to join us in time. So the three categories I spoke about in my opening remarks were members of your household, face-to-face -face, uh, contact. I'm going to hand over to Gregor to say a bit more about you know, what that is. Uh, and thirdly, uh, people that you have been uh, an, uh, in contact with at a distance of less than two metres for a period of 15 minutes or more. So I, I set out these three categories. Um, in my, my opening statement and, and happy to repeat them uh, now. But Gregor, do you want to say a bit more about face-to-face? -face? Certainly. I mean, in terms of face-to-face, -face, it's, it's people who've had direct contact within one metre um, and, and there's, there's no time limit on, on that kind of contact and that might involve anything from um, direct touch uh, to just having a conversation in, in, in that close proximity. It's really important that we understand that that increases the risk of the transmissibility of this virus, even uh, beyond that which we see uh, for, for the slightly um, lesser risk of the two metre contact for um, 15 minutes or longer. Of the third category, the household category, I think it's also important to understand that while that's largely self-explanatory in terms of if people are living in what we conventionally think of as a household, there will be certain circumstances such as um, communal living, shared kitchen space, where we need to consider how that impacts on the transmissibility of this virus as well. So those three categories taken together give us a, 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 a kind of basis on which we can start to build that contact tracing process. So, and I think almost uh, well, the three categories are set out and with a bit more definition there, but sometimes it's easier to understand these things uh, on the basis of what is not included. So just passing somebody in the street, for example, um, or having fleeting contact uh, with, with somebody in passing is, is not going to be a close contact, having a conversation with them uh, within that one metre uh, is and the two metres for more than 15 minutes. So these are all things that uh, we will make sure are set out very clearly so that people understand that. But remember, you know, the contact tracer, if, if you find yourself in the position of testing positive, the contact tracer will be able to take you through some of this and help you to uh, assess who your contacts have been and whether or not they are people that should be getting traced. Uh, Tom Gordon from The Herald. Uh, hi, First Minister. Sorry, it's Alistair Grant. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tom is having technical problems. Um, can I just ask, will further sector-specific funding be in place for businesses as, as the four-stage plan to ease the lockdown comes into effect? Uh, to give just one example, small grassroots music venues have real concerns that they will not be able to survive if they are simply told they can reopen but must maintain social distancing rules. Uh, so will further funding be made available to help them and other businesses cope and, if necessary, stay closed or operate at a drastically reduced capacity. And can I also just ask quickly, uh, the Herald has today launched a Garden of Remembrance campaign uh, to create a place where people can go to remember relatives they may have lost during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, this could see a, a memorial cairn built to remember the victims of COVID-19 in Scotland. Is this something you would lend your support to? Um, I'll, I'll come back to that important issue in a second. On, on the business support, you know, these are things we'll keep under uh, ongoing review. We've made substantial support available to businesses, although I, I know that that doesn't completely compensate every business for every 
loss uh, and we will continue to consider what we can do in what form and, and for what sectors. There are some sectors that undoubtedly are going to need support for longer and uh, the, the sector that you talked about there is definitely in that category. So uh, I'm not able to stand here and give guarantees or specific funding uh, commitments today, but I, I do want to uh, make very clear that these are things that are never far away from the minds of uh, myself and my ministers and Kate Forbes and Fiona Hislop, the Finance and Economy Secretaries, respond, uh, respectively, are, are looking at these things on, on a daily basis. Of course, we want to try to get businesses operating um, as, as close to normal as possible, as quickly as possible. But again, that will be easier in some sectors than it will be in others. And, and that has to continue to be taken into account. Um, so y yes, that is, uh, in terms of the Garden of Remembrance proposal, um, Alistair, that is exactly the kind of thing I, I would be instinctively very supportive of. I absolutely know that at an appropriate time, we will want as a country to... Uh, remember and pay tribute to those uh, who've lost their lives uh, from this virus and you know we will also want to appropriately recognize all of those who've made a contribution to tackling uh, this virus and I think it's it's really important for all of us uh, you know emotionally for all of us as well as for this the sake of those who have suffered direct loss that we do that um, so yes in general I would be supportive of that my, my only caveat is I think we would probably want to do some uh, discussion with and consultation with families who have been affected to, to get a sense of what the, the preferred and most appropriate way of doing that would be. But I certainly um, am supportive of and would applaud the sentiment behind uh, the campaign that you've talked about today. Um, Callum Ross from the PNG. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, can I just follow up on the question about locally accessible testing and, and home testing? Um, would it be the case that remote and rural areas might be kind of a priority and, and first in line in terms of that expansion and, and, and home testing? I think you can take it as read that remote and rural areas are very much in our minds because obviously the distances involved are, uh, are often more prohibitive to people trans, uh, transporting themselves to testing. But Fiona, do you want to say a bit more? Absolutely. So remote and rural, clearly yes, because the distance there um, tends to, do, to be much greater. And we know that we have health coverage right across our country. So what we will do, as I've said already, we would want and encourage people to, to go to testing centres. But where that's not possible, and we'll certainly be, be looking at making sure that everyone has access to a test, and that may be home testing. Yes, remote and rural, but we'll also have other people who live in more urban areas where they have other responsibilities and it may be two or three buses. So we need to be very, very careful that we, we don't discriminate against people with, without cars or without transport, uh, but we will absolutely be making sure that everyone has access to a test who needs one. Thank you. Um, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. First Minister, um Will there be any sanctions or fines for people who uh, fail to give proper information to contact tracers um, or for those who break their 14-day isolation? How much will these be, if so? Um, and are reports from last week correct that there could be a 12-month prison sentence for giving incorrect information to contact tracers? We'll keep all of these things under review, but let me be very clear here. Um, I, you know, the, the Chief Constable on a few occasions now has stood next to me at these updates and talked about, you know, the number of fixed penalty notices that have been issued during lockdown um, and made the point that these are a tiny minority um, of uh, people in our country because the vast majority of people have abided by the rules of uh, lockdown and, and all of the different bits of advice that we've given for the right reasons because we all know it's for our own protection and for the protection of those we love. We have, you know, this has been a horrible, horrible, horrible experience for everybody in the country, particularly those who've suffered loss. Uh, but out of it has, I think, come a sense of real collective care and solidarity. And that's what I want Test and Protect to be built on as well. So, of course, in any system, you have to think about the exceptions uh, and we'll think about that and keep that under review. But for now, I want to persuade you, the public, to do what is required of you under Test and Protect for the same reasons that you've all stayed at home and obeyed the rules, because this is about the protection of all of us. And I think we'll all get much further on that basis than we will about a, a discussion about penalties and fines and possible prison sentences. We're all... We're all experiencing this very differently, um, and I think that's something that we should never forget, but we are still all 
in this in a way that we all have a role to play to combat it. And that's what I want to focus on as much as possible. Uh, Libby Brooks from The Guardian. Hello, First Minister. Um, the BBC's polling this morning uh, showed that the Scottish Government is very much in tune with concerns that the public have about an early return to schools and nurseries. And I know that you've acknowledged the difficulties that are faced, especially by women who are trying to juggle childcare and work for a bit longer. Um, but I wanted to know if you were going to be issuing any further advice or guidance for employers on this um, Given, given this longer time frame, and also if there's going to be a more definitive time frame anytime soon for a full for a return to sort of full time childcare beyond childminders. Um, so, can I just point out um, for those who understandably might not be aware of this, uh, John Swinney, the Education Secretary, is making a statement in Parliament this afternoon, uh, which will uh, no doubt cover some of these issues um, and. You know, while we might not be able to give absolutely definitive timescales for all of these things right now, uh, we are working to be able to do that as soon as possible. Um, the phase one of the uh, plan to come out of lockdown, of course, has childminders operating uh, ahead of schools going back. So this is very much a, a phased approach that we will uh, continue to try to, to do as quickly as possible, but absolutely as safely um, as, as we need to. And yes, we will all along and all of these issues seek to give guidance to employers, uh, just as we are doing around test and protect. Uh, employers will have to you know, have a, a degree of patience and understanding uh, or for parents who have childcare challenges. And as I said in Parliament last week, I think, and you know, this is perhaps a, an area where we can take a, a bit of a positive out of the negative of the crisis. This is an opportunity for some rethinking about normal working practices. Can we have home working where possible as a, a longer term proposition? Because we're going to have to be doing it for quite some time because of this virus anyway. Flexible working. Um, I think employers really need to think about flexible working, you know, a four day week or other ways that, that parents in particular can adapt uh, their working lives to accommodate different challenges for the foreseeable future around uh, childcare. So these are all things that we will uh, try to give as much uh, guidance on as possible and steer uh, people and the country um, to the, the safe reopening of schools um, as quickly as possible and, and childcare along the way. Uh, and lastly, today, Andrew Learmonth from The National. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Oh, on Test Protect, I I'm wondering how you'll be able to get in touch with people who've been identified at contact of someone with coronavirus. It, it seems the system uh, maybe relies on people knowing their contacts, but you can have face-to-face -face meetings with people uh, you don't know. Uh, you can be on the train or the bus and easily be less than two metres away from someone for 15 minutes without knowing who they are. How, how do you contact those people? Uh, and secondly, you said earlier that it would only work if we all do what was required of us, and you know it cannot be seen as optional, but given the revelations about Dominic Cummings over the weekend, are you confident that this ask of the public hasn't already been fatally undermined? Uh, yes, I, I'm going to hand over to Gregor to say a bit more about contact tracing. Um, we're, we're, I should say on that, we're looking at the ways in which different countries are doing this and trying to learn uh, as much as we can uh, along the way from that. At some point in the future, um, although I think it is in the future and we've not built the system around it, the idea of a, a proximity app may have a part to play, but you know, as I say, we're not building it around that. Uh, on the latter part of your, your question, um, yeah, I am confident that the Scottish people will continue to do the right thing because uh, while I'm sure there's a lot of anger and frustration about certain things we've been hearing about in the last few days, ultimately we all know that we are not just complying with all of this advice because somebody is telling us to we're complying with it because it's in our own interests and um, I don't think the Scottish people are, are going to get into position of us cutting off our nose to spite our face we, we're doing this for the best of reasons it's protecting ourselves it's protecting the people we love and it's protecting our wider communities and I think that common sense and desire to do the right thing will shine through I've uh, certainly had that faith in the the good sense of the Scottish people reinforced and strengthened in me over the past couple of months, and I've got no reason to believe that that will change as we go into the next phase of this. Greg? I think it's important to, to kind of recognise at this point in time that contact tracing is not a new step in public health. It's, it's something that's been used for years and years and years, and that teams have become very adept at, uh, at managing. And, and by and large, the experience has been that people are very willing to participate in that contact tracing process and able to share the details that are important so that that contact tracing can actually take place. So, so we're on a, a kind of well-worn path here. 
um, where we know the, the, the footing is fairly firm. And where there's more complex arrangements which are necessary because of the type of contact that people have had, maybe it has been in a more open situation, those are generally a, a, a assessed by very experienced health protection professionals who look at the entirety of the risk in that scenario and, and, and then there's various ways that they can explore um, how they might contact people who um, they feel um, are necessary to contact uh, when, when that situation arises and that might be because of the, the use in a kind of more open space uh, where it's, it's not immediately um, available, the, the kind of contact details of the people who might have been in, participating there. So, th so there's nothing about this that is new and we'll be kind of um, uh, kind of falling back on, on, on well-worn processes to make sure that we um, contact as many people as possible. I think that's a good point to, to end on, actually. The, the scale of what we're about to do is new because it's much bigger than anything we've done before, but the, the principles of it and the tried and tested approaches, as Gregor said, are not new. Uh, for other infectious diseases, uh, you know, Ebola, for example, on a much smaller scale, experts are used to doing this. So we're not absolutely starting from uh, nothing here, far from it. We're just having to scale it up to a much, much bigger uh, form. Um, that concludes our questions today. So my thanks to uh, Gregor and Fiona and Anna, uh, our BSL interpreter for today. Uh, thanks to all of you. I appreciate earlier on I gave you quite a lot of information there that might have been quite hard to absorb all at once. But I would remind you, you'll be seeing this logo behind me here. You'll be seeing a lot of it in the coming days. We will have that public awareness and marketing campaign start to kick in at the end of the week. Uh, and in uh, a few weeks, you'll be getting information through your doors. And you can always, of course, access NHS Inform uh, to find out more about uh, what I've been talking about today. Uh, but remember, from Thursday, if you've got symptoms... NHS Inform or the helpline at NHS 24 to book a test. That's the one message I want to uh, want you please to take away from today. Um, I will be in the Scottish Parliament uh, delivering the update tomorrow at 12.20 um, at a session of First Minister's questions and then we will be back here in St Andrew's House at 12.30 on Thursday. But for now, thank you for joining us.